You're not. Well, we're going to work on that as we talk, so it's coming up. That's great. You know, I, count, I call the sound booth back there the CB booth, and I think we should call it the CB booth, but that's character builder booth. And um, it, it encourages our behavior and our character, and we're supposed to look at that CB booth as they do in James as a various trial, and we're supposed to rejoice in that because a various trial produces what? Patience and perfection. And so let's rejoice with the CB booth back there and thank those people. I mean, we think it's easy, but let me tell you, Stanley is, a, is a, an attorney and um, his knife is sharp. He is a brilliant guy. And if Stanley can't get it, it's complicated. And so we rejoice and, th and are so thankful for Stanley and uh, all the people that are back there and uh, for the people that are in the choir who lead our um, service and, and cause us to worship. Um, we're, we're thankful for them. And uh, let's just remember that that's a CB box back there. It's a character builder. And, uh, and we're going to rejoice and uh, rejoice in, in the lessons that it gives us and that we will be called into perfection. Amen? Amen. Is it true that only the Jews are the chosen people? I want you to think about that. Are they the chosen people? The scripture says they are the chosen people. Is it true that when God chose Israel as a nation... He didn't choose any other nation? Is that true? The Jews grew up thinking that. They thought and still believe today that God chose them, and consequently, God did not choose any other nation. In fact, if you look at the screen at this... Um, Ironic blessing. This comes from Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 26. Aaron was the high priest appointed by God to lead the Israelite nation in the worship. And God, through him, wrote this blessing. And you've heard it. You've probably said it to one another. I say it all the time when I write letters and when I talk to people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the Israelites, when they were going through the desert and the wilderness, received this ironic blessing from Aaron. And it became a household blessing that they used all the time from one another. They would greet one another on the street, and they would say, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. It was something that they said all the time. And in the back of their minds, they were saying, We are the chosen people. No one else is chosen. In fact, they believed that Yahweh had blessed them. He chose Abraham and Sarah. They couldn't have kids. But miraculously, after 30 years of a character-building experience, Sarah had a baby, Isaac. And from that offspring, there were born more people than the stars of the sky can be counted and more than the sand that is on the seashore. And God kept Israel and blessed them. And they believed that Yahweh did that. They believed that Yahweh shone their face upon the Jews. He took that band of 70 down from Canaan to Egypt. They lived in Egypt to the point where when they left and all the miracles happened of the plagues, they went through the wilderness, their shoes didn't wear out. They had manna that came down from heaven. They were blessed beyond recognition in the sense that God really did bless them. His face shone upon them. And because of that, 
they believed that they were the only ones. The scripture says that God carried them out of Egypt to three million people now in the wilderness on the wings of eagles. And so the Jews under church understood that they were chosen, that they were blessed, that God's face shone upon them, that he was gracious to them. He lifted up his countenance on them. They understood that. And as a result of that, he believed and they believed that God did not choose any other nation. In fact, the Jews thought that the other nations were unclean. They were Gentiles. They were the scum of the earth. The Jews even called the other nations dogs. I mean, they were categorized categorically convinced that they were blessed and no other nation was blessed. Even the great apostle Peter, he had a hard time understanding that God wanted to bless other nations. You remember in Acts chapter 10, Peter is in a home, it's not his, he's hungry, he goes up and he's meditating and he has a vision. And he has this vision from God, and he sees this sheet drop down from heaven. And on this sheet are unclean animals. And he hears a voice from God, and that voice says, kill and eat. And uh, Peter says, no, Lord. Those are unclean things. I haven't eaten anything unclean. And Jesus, or God, to make this poignant... And so that he understands that God wants Peter to change his view. He does this three times. And after the third time, Peter has another vision. And the vision is that there's going to be people coming to his house, and he's supposed to follow them to the next destination. And those people that are going to be coming to his house are Gentiles, the scum of the earth, dogs. And he's supposed to follow them. And then in Acts 10 and 11, he sees Cornelius, a, a Roman, from a Roman empire, the, the, the worthless person of Rome in this, this dogmatic, authoritative empire, wants to come to Jesus by faith. And Peter is seeing this, and he's having a hard time. He can't understand why God would want to choose the Gentiles. And so this was something that was in their mindset. And all through the scriptures, you read a different narrative. It's not the narrative that, uh, that Peter was taught. It's not the narrative that the Israelites were taught. This other na uh, narrative is that God really does care for other people. So you, if you look now in your Bibles to Psalm 67, we see something really interesting in Psalm 67. You look at the first verse in Psalm 67.1, and what do you see there in Psalm 67.1? May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. It's the ironic blessing right here in Psalm 67. It's, it's not exactly the same as Numbers chapter 6, but any Orthodox Jew who's reading his Hebrew Bible realizes that this is the ironic blessing here. And he says, that's, that's the way I like to hear it. I like to hear that in, in Psalms, God is blessing the people of Israel. But he's reading in the Hebrew, and he understands that in Numbers chapter 6, the word for God is Yahweh, which means that no one can pronounce that word, and the Jews just write it, because it's too holy to pronounce. But in this psalm, the word for God is Elohim, which is the plural, and it's a word that anyone can pronounce. You can say Elohim. And the Gentiles can see it and say it. And so this Orthodox Jew who's reading Elohim here, 
he's realizing, hey, there's something different with this psalm here. There's something different with this verse. What is, what is the Holy Spirit trying to communicate with me? Is he trying to communicate with me that, that it's not just Yahweh, but it's the name for everybody's God. Everybody maybe can worship God here. And then if you look at a quote uh, in, from Christopher White Wright, and he says something very eloquent. Christopher White says that in his book, The Mission of God, from the viewpoint of missions, the election of Israel has a different emphasis. The election of Israel does not imply the rejection of other nations. Israel's chosen, the other nations are not. The Bible doesn't teach that. He says, on the contrary, from the beginning, it is portrayed as for their benefit. God did not call Abraham from among the nations to accomplish their rejection, but to initiate the process of their redemption. And this is a message for the Jews, that it's just not their religion. God wants to bless all the people. God did not call Abraham from among the nations to accomplish their rejection. So if you look at verse 9, uh, verse 2 now, in Psalm 67, it says, That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all the people. I imagine the Orthodox Jew who's reading this, his jaw drops to the table. And he sees that the second verse of this psalm is what really is truly God's will that all the nations will come to saving faith. It's not just for the Jews. This psalm is called a missionary psalm, and it's evident that God loves all the nations. I want you to say that with me. God loves all the nations. Let's do that again. God loves all the nations. We need to have that showered upon us every time we get up. God loves all the nations because we're all racist. We all like our own better than we like others. We all like our own language in our mouths better than we like the language in our mouths from somebody who's not from our country. Let's be honest, that's life. But as we read the scripture, we are being pounded every day that God loves the nations. That is so important for us to clothe ourselves in. He loves the nations so much. In fact, God wants all the nations of the earth to be blessed. This psalm lists that there are three blessings that God wants to give the nations. Verse 2, he wants to give the nations salvation. He wants to save them. That's important. Verse 4, God wants to bless all the nations by judging them with equity and blessing them and guiding them on the earth. So he wants to bless the nations, all of the nations, with equity, with justice, with uprightness. And verse 6, he wants to bless all the nations, and that word for nations is people groups or kinship groups. You see Woli? Woli comes from Nigeria. You think that's one nation. That's not one nation at all. There are 450 people groups in Nigeria that have a different language, a different culture, a different way of living. One people group is entirely different than another. And God loves each and every one of them. He wants all the nations to be saved. He wants all the nations to be judged with the equity of God. And verse 6, God wants to give all nations 
his abundance, his generosity. And God wants all the nations to know that. So the first blessing is that God wants his saving power to go out among all the people. In order for God to bless the nations with salvation, he has to deal with the big problem. Do you know what the big problem is? Well, if you look on the slide, the biggest problem on the planet, says John Piper, is Adam was my dad. That's the big problem. And Adam brought sin into the world. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men. And all men have sinned. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. Because of man's sin, we are condemned. We are condemned to death by a holy God, and we are separated from him. Because of man's disobedience, he's irreparably stained. He's marked. And there's nothing you can do. But... All the religions in the world, and I want you to know, and I want you to make this part of your life, when somebody asks you, what religion are you, please say, I don't have a, I don't have a religion. Please do not say, I'm of the religion Baptist, or I'm the religion Pentecostal, I am a religion Anglican. Because the evangelical church does not have a religion. And it's never had a religion. It has a relationship. And a relationship is totally different and diametrically opposed from a religion. All the religions in the world are based on works. I have to earn the right to enter into God's presence. And they're all that way. It doesn't matter if it's a religion that came out of the States or a religion that came in Southeast Asia. They all have a series of works that you have to do so you can earn the favor of God. They're all meritorious. And God says, I don't have a religion for people to enter into my relationship. God has a relationship. All the religions say you need to sell indulgences. You need to suffer for your sins in purgatory. You have to beat your back with chains. You have to wash yourself in rivers. You have to place baskets of fruit and eggs so the gods will be pleased. You have to worship and pay penance. You have to do things for your ancestor. You have to sacrifice animals. You have to even sacrifice your children. It's all based on meritorious works. And that is not the economy of God. God does not put your works in a scale. He doesn't put your works in a balance. All the religions believe that if I do good works, God puts those good works in this balance here. And if I do bad works, he puts it in this balance here. But if my good works outweigh my bad works, then I make it. God grades on a curve. Nothing is more heretical than that. Nothing is more out of line with Scripture than that. It's like the evangelism explosion um, illustration. Have you heard it? Let's say Marcos uh, from uh, Brazil. Uh, he comes over and I say, Marcos, I want to I fix you some lunch. I'm not the greatest cook, but I can make an omelet. And so I put four eggs in a pan, and I stir it up, and I look at Marcos. I see that he's hungry. So I crack the fifth egg, and I put it in the pan. Well, the fifth egg is rotten. My mom says, I've never seen a rotten egg, but my mom said, 
when you crack an, a rotten egg in a pan, it ruins the pan immediately. And it, it will tarnish the surface of the pan, and it will turn green, and there will be smoke that comes up. And I don't have any more eggs, so I just keep stirring and ignore that. And I put in some ham, and I put in some cheese, and I put in some peppers, and I fold it over, and I cut a half. I put half in the plate for Marco, and I put half in my plate, and I give my plate, I uh, give Marco his half. Marcos, so you going to eat that? No, because it's all rotten. And that's how we are. Sin, it isn't like sin comes into our body and it stays here and, and then I can deal with it when I want. I could push it over here and that way. No, it pollutes everything. There is no good inside of you, it says in Romans 3. Nothing is good about you because you're stained with sin. And Galatians 2.16 says, No flesh is justified by works. So the biggest lie and the biggest problem is Adam is my dad. But the biggest blessing and the biggest solution on the planet is that Jesus Christ is the second Adam. He is the one who brings the solution. And it's not by works. If you look at Romans 5:17, it says, "For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one man's Jesus Christ." When I was in Italy, I would always ask a question to the Italians who are in that religion. And I'd ask, how does one attain grace? Well, if they knew their catechism, they would say, by doing the sacraments. Because it's a sacri sacerdotal religion, and you do those sacraments to obtain grace. And I would say, according to this verse in the Bible, you cannot earn grace. Grace is nothing you can work for. Grace is a gift. And you receive gifts by faith. You don't work for grace. Grace is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace we have been saved by faith. Way before the second Adam died on the cross... God chose for himself one man, a man who was similar to all men. He was an idol worshiper. He sold out his wife by asking her to tell a half-truth about him. Not once, but twice. And he was a liar. And all of his children were liars. His name was... Abraham, and he was in a false idol worship pagan society, and what happened? God called him. God called him. Matt Schleiger says, isn't it fascinating that as soon as God divides the people of Babel, or Babel, in Genesis 11, and at that point in Genesis 11, the world is probably at the lowest point it has ever been. They've gone through one cycle of a start, disobedience, decline, and judgment by the flood. And then they go through the next cycle of a new start after the flood, decline, disobedience, and judgment at the Tower of Babel. And now all the countries are scattered, and the nations are scattered. And uh, I imagine at that time, humanity is the lowest it's ever been. And what does God do? Genesis 12, right after Babel, Genesis 1, 11. What's Genesis 12? It's the Abrahamic covenant. And if you can pull that up on the screen... 
It says, And Yahweh said to Abram, Get yourself up and go from your land and from your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and I will bless you. Those who bless you, whereas um, I will bless those who bless you, whereas the one who belittles you, I will curse. And in you will be blessed all the kinship groups of earth. And Abram went just as Yahweh said to him. Then if you look at Genesis 15, 6, probably one of the most important verses of all of Scripture, it says, Abraham believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was put in his account. It was a gift. He believed God, and God gifted him with grace and gifted him with righteousness. So all of his sins and that dirty omelet are thrown out and God has given to him now righteous standing before God. And that is called justification. Just as if I have never sinned. It's the best word in the Bible. Justification. God justifies me because I believe in him. And that's what Abraham did. The greatest compliment you can give to God is to believe in him. It's not to do things for him. He doesn't need your works. He's the eternal, omnipotent God. He can do everything. He needs and wants your faith. That's what he wants. That's the greatest gift you can give to God. And that's what pleases him the most. What does it say in Hebrews 11:6 That those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The greatest gift you can give to God is that you believe in him and that belief justifies you. Not based on what you've done. You can't do anything. But based on what he has done as the second Adam on the cross. He paid the debt we could not pay. He extinguished the righteous wrath of God towards us in our disobedience that we could not extinguish. He adopted us as believers into his family, and we are children of God by faith. And it is so wonderful to believe that I don't have to earn it. Romans 4 says, Abraham had a lot to boast about because of what he did, but not before God. Because we don't have a religion. We have a relationship. You stand at the altar with your fiancé, and you say, I do. That is a step, step of faith. And you say, I do, to her so that you can have a relationship with her and she can have one with you and it is a walk of faith marriage and you come into Christ it is a walk of faith and God saves us by faith so as we read in Galatians 3 6 and 7 just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Anyone who believes in God, it doesn't matter if they're in Brunei in Indonesia or Bhutan uh, next to Nepal or if they're in uh, Cochabamba, uh, Bolivia. It doesn't matter if they believe by faith. They're children of Adam. And that is so important. So, that's the first blessing, salvation. And God wants all the nations to know that. And the second blessing that he wants us to know in verse 4, it says, Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, 
For you judge the prophets, you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. And so God wants all the nations, number one, to know salvation, and number two, to know that God is a God of equity, uprightness, and kindness. The Gentiles can rejoice, for God shall judge or rule them with a just and equitable government. He will lead those Gentiles as he led Israel through the wilderness. God will judge people with uprightness and fairness. No one wants to be under the judgment of a capricious God, a God who's passive and aggressive. No one wants to be under a parent who's like that. But at times, we as parents are all passive and aggressive at times. Sometimes we shower our children with love and goodness and we love them to death and the next moment we're ready to tear their hair their head off i mean that's how we are but god is not like that god is an upright god who judges us with fairness all the idol gods are capricious and vindictive if you don't do exactly as they say they squash you they banish you. They punish you. You have to earn their favor with trinkets and sacrifices and religious good works. And it doesn't work. You know, all the nations have a way of saying goodbye. I think the English way of saying goodbye is probably one of the weakest, if you want to know my opinion. All we say is goodbye. We can say, see you later, alligator. Or we can say, uh, catch on the rebound. Those are all vernaculars, all idioms, and people have to learn those, and those are hard to learn. But that's how we say goodbye. In Italy, uh, they have a formal way of saying goodbye, and then they have different ways. So if I'm with the president of Italy and I'm saying goodbye to him, I would say, arrivederla. That's in the formal. Uh, if I'm saying goodbye to a group, I'd say arrivederci, and that means we'll see you again. Um, or if I'm a little more informal and I'm a group of basketball players, I'd say um, ci vediamo or ci si vede. And that means, yeah, I'll see you later. If I'm really informal, I'll just say ciao. Ciao when I say hello, ciao when I say goodbye. Makes it easy that way. So you go to Italy, ciao. But if I know I'm not going to see you again, maybe you're going to die, and I'm not going to see you again. Or if I know that um, you're going to war, and it might happen that you die on the battlefield, and this might be the last time for me to say goodbye, I say it differently. I say adio. And dio means God in Italian. And ad means to, to God. And it can mean a lot of things, but it really means this. You're so precious to me, and I don't know what's going to happen. The only thing I can do is to give you to God. Because if I give you to God, I know that he's impartial. I know he's upright. I know he's a God of equity. And I know that whatever happens, he is in the best hands that I can put you in. I can put you in God's hands. A deal to God. And God wants all of the nations to know that we have a God who's equitable, upright, impartial, and fair. A deal. Psalms 99.4 says, The strength of the king loves justice. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. God the king, his strength is that he judges you and I with justice and righteousness. And he does it in Israel, which is Jacob, but he does it for all the nations as well. 
And then there's a refrain here in verse 5. It says, let all the peoples praise you. O God, let all the nations praise you. Let's praise God because each person on earth has been made in God's image. And God wants each one from each tribe, each nation, each language to know his salvation and his uprightness. Let all the peoples praise you. One preacher said, when the, God, when the blessings of God come down, praise should go up. And we should be people of praise because he saves us and he judges us with equity. And then the third blessing is that he blesses us with abundance. Verse 6 says, the earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. Christopher Wright says, when God blesses someone, it normally includes increase of family, flocks, wealth, or all three. That's how God blesses. God's blessings means the enjoying of good gifts of God's creation in abundance. Now those who trust in God will not lack. They may not be uh, extravagantly rich. They may not be super rich, but they will not lack either. And the scripture says that they will prosper and they will be blessed because you believe. And belief brings blessing. And so... How do we respond to the blessings of God? We respond with praise. And then in verse 8, we respond with respect. This is the application. It's right here in the text. Verse 8, it says, God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Fear means in this text to reverence or to respect. And so when we receive the blessings of salvation, the blessings of equity, the blessings of abundance, our attitude is respect. To be humbled by what God has given us. We are not to think that we're entitled. We're not to think that God wants us to live by the can. And the can is, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can for yourself. That is not what God wants. We are not entitled to live that way. We are to be a channel of blessing, not a conduit that keeps all the goodies for ourselves. We are to be a river, not a can. We are to be not a cul-de-sac, cul but a fountain that blesses others. John Piper says, I have blessed the American church more than her wildest dreams. My blessings are not a curse, but they can become one if it is not used in the way God desires. I hope that we are not a cul-de-sac that just collects all the blessings for ourselves and those blessings begin to stink because we are too egocentric. That's the application. We're blessed to be a blessing. God has blessed us and we are supposed to bless others. There's two responses to this. There's the centrifugal response. And centrifugal means that the power comes from the center and it goes outward. And so Abraham was centrifugal. He was the first missionary. He was commanded what? To go and to bless. So whenever we go, wherever it is, across the nation, or we're traveling, or we're going on a trip, we need to be centrifugal. Because it's not just our blessings, we're channels of blessings. Then we go and we bless as Abraham. We bless with our comportment, our behavior. 
and we bless with the gospel. We tell people that you cannot earn your salvation. It is a gift, and gifts are received by faith. So we need to be centrifugal. Missionaries are this way. They go and they bless. And they do it because God has blessed them. And then we also need to be centripetal. And if you look at centripetal, the power goes to the inside. And that's what Israel was supposed to be. Israel was supposed to be centripetal. But it doesn't mean that they were collecting all these blessings for themselves and they were chosen and nobody else was chosen. It doesn't mean that at all. They were to be a showcase. Have you ever been to a museum, especially a museum in Europe? Those, those curators and museums in Europe are really smart, I'm telling you. You go down a big hall and then pretty soon there'll be a secondary hall. And at the end of the secondary hall, you can't see, it's from a distance, you'll, shoot, you'll see this huge showcase. And from 100 yards, you're looking at it, and man, it looks spectacular. Man, there's, go there's jewels in there. You can see them shining and twinkling. There's gold in there. And, and there's crowns. That's, that's Israel. Israel was to shout to the nations, Come and see. Come and see me. Because I have it. What do I have? I'm called to be a holy nation. So I have God's morality. And I can walk with God and talk with God because I'm living by faith and I understand what he wants me to live. I'm a holy nation. And I'm also what? I'm a priestly nation. I'm a mediator who will tell you how you can have a relationship with God. So all the nations around Israel were supposed to be attracted by the way Israel lived because Israel was centropia, centripetal. They, they were this force that was to shine and to be brilliant and they weren't stagnant, collecting everything for themselves, but they were, they were giving it out as people came. They were blessed to be a blessing. They were to shine all over. And that's what we are to do. We are God's church, and he has not given all these things for us for our pers per personal aggrandizement. If you look at Ralph Winner's quote, Ralph Winner was a missiologist last half of this last a century, he was the creator of the Perspectives Course. He says, America is killing itself by not giving. It's a call to sack. It's starting to stink. And he went on to say, America is wealthy for a reason. Don't put your wealth in a bag of holes. When the blessings come down, praise and respect go up. We are blessed to be a blessing. Would you pray with me, please? I'm going to guide our prayer time. There's going to be two portions of it. The first is, I'd like you just to reflect. Is your house a showcase? Or is it a cul-de-sac? Or a cistern that collects just for itself. Reflect on that for a minute and ask God to adjust you and help you to adjust if it's necessary. I know I need adjustment in that area. Ask the Lord to help you be a conduit Ask the Lord to help you to be a channel. Ask the Lord that you would change your heart as he wanted to change the heart of Israel. That it's not just about them, but it's for the world. God loves all the nations. The second thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pray for the nations. 
I'm big on the fact that if we pray for our thumbs, we pray for about 5.4 billion people in the world every day just by praying for our thumbs. And these people that represent by the thumb don't know Jesus, haven't heard about him, don't know another Christian. And if we can pray for our thumbs every day, we are showing that we love the nations. So the T for thumbs is tribal. There are 794 million tribal people around the world. Pray for them that people who are centrifugal would go and reach them and pray that you can help in that. Then we have the Hindu people. 1.8 billion, no, 1.1 billion Hindu people. Pray for them. Then we have the unreligious communists. 1.2 billion. Ask God to intervene and to send people. Pray for China. China may close, but the underground church can survive. Pray that it does. Pray for the Muslims. M. 1.8 billion who don't know Jesus. Pray that the Holy Spirit would manifest in them through visions and dreams and that they would come by faith. And then the B of the thumb, Buddhists, five, 521 million. Ask God to use the missionaries who are in Japan and Miramar and the 11 countries that are Buddhist. Pray for those nations that God would have a a beachhead of the gospel that would penetrate. And then the Sikhs, 30 million Sikhs who don't know Jesus, who are very arrogant in their faith. Pray that God would reach them. We're blessed to be a blessing. Oh God, help us in becoming just that.